And three, two, one. And we're live. Welcome once again to HeroQuest fans. This time we're only a couple of minutes late. So, uh, unfortunately, I have some bad news. Um, my order is delayed. <laughs> I should have known that there was going to be some more waiting time because I had ordered a Space Crusade from uh, someone in uh, the UK. And it sounded like it was going to be delivered last night. But I should have realized because it said by 8 p.m. And I thought, 8 p.m., that doesn't sound quite right. Because I'm used to getting the mail around, you know, 4 or 5 in the afternoon at the latest. But I thought, okay, whatever. Um, and then the next morning, of course, uh, it just says nothing. So I'm still waiting. So I'm going to give it maybe a week or two. And then I should have it on hand. So, sorry to get anybody's hopes up. I was disappointed, too. I was like, oh, man, what am I going to talk about? But the show must go on. So, first of all, a shout-out to everybody in the Discord for HeroQuest fans. I'll just take a quick look over there. So, we didn't have a whole lot of burning questions this time. Although, from YouTube, I did get uh, quite a few requests. Surprisingly, I was... I was surprised, at least, for um, people wanting to know how did I make those Zargon dice that I put in the HeroQuest Vibes videos. So what I mean by that is, let me just switch over to my camera and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So here's our familiar little uh, game space. So these, these are custom dice, obviously. Now these, uh, you can see here, let me just get down to the, sorry for the noisy camera there, low budget setup. So these are the original HeroQuest dice, classic HeroQuest. They're obviously very well worn. This was a used set that I had and you know, our original dice were pretty much in this condition. We would take like a permanent marker and try to color that in. But I mean, these are wood. They got a nice uh, rolling ability to them as I drop them under the table. And they're a little bit small, but you know, for kids' hands, they're fine. These over here are from a German website called Spiel, Spiel Waren Saloon. I'm probably saying that wrong, but um, I'm not sure exact, the exact translation, something about the game saloon place or something like that, game shop. I don't know. I, any German, native German speakers know what it means, but he, uh, he makes these custom dice. So these are plastic. They got the rounded corners, which unlike the 2021 Hasbro remake, which have square corners. These are like rounded. So sometimes, you know, the dice can be cockeyed when you're rolling them in a dice rolling box, but I like them. And as you can see, they're bigger than the, the classic dice. But the other thing is if you, this guy, he makes them, he just has like little hand stamps, I think. I don't think he does them by machine, but you may want to get a little bit of uh, varnish, put a clear coat on there. Because otherwise, like the oil from your hands, it can cause it to get kind of gummy. Especially if you get the gloss finish dice. So if you do order some from him, again, this is not a plug. Whenever I mention a company, I'm always careful to say, hey, this is not an endorsement. Um, I'm not saying that you need to do business with these companies. If you choose to, great. But I don't get anything from them. No free products, no kickbacks or advertising or anything like that. Don't have any promo codes to give out. Sorry. Um, yeah, so with these, like, ask him for uh, matte finish instead of glossy. Because I think they, they tend to, like, hold their characters a little bit better. Um, so, yeah, these wooden dice, I mean, some people prefer wooden dice. And I guess there's people on Etsy that sell them. Like, carved. I mean, they're actually inscribed. If you can see that. Um, but I mean, these are just 
little paint stamps or like ink stamps basically. So I talk about Zargon dice. What are Zargon dice? Well, one of the, I guess the luxury items that gamers like is they like to have dice for the players, the hero players in Hero Quest, and then an extra set of dice for Zargon. Okay, so you got 12 dice. That makes sense. So they don't have to keep swapping back and forth, especially if you're playing. Well, I guess if you're playing over Zoom, you don't doesn't matter because you just point the camera at your own dice. But I thought, okay, when you're rolling them together, like let's say you're rolling them in the box over here, this dice box, you roll your dice, and then Zargon has his own set, and they're a different color to show, you know, his dice. They have the same exact denominations of, you know, three skulls, one black shield and two white shields. But the Spiel, Shalor Spiel Warren saloon guy, he like sells pink ones. So it's not just for girls, but if you like pink, you can have those. These are cool. They're red with gold symbols. So kind of like the movement dice. Um, these are just ones that I bought and painted, not perfectly, just painted them by hand. Instead of having white pips, these little these little holes are called pips, like pip squeaks. No, <laughs> it's pips. So, um, yeah, it could be red with gold. But then these are the ones that caught people's eye. These dice, and you'll notice something about them. Look at the symbol. It's actually it's not inscribed, but it's it's like paint that's almost been like printed on top. It has a little bit of texture to it. And you can see it's not perfect. Like if you look really closely, you can see there's white. That's not just shiny from the light. That's actually white. So I didn't remove every single pixel because it was originally a, a black image and I made it a white image and then I colored it red because I was playing around with the colors and I didn't quite get all the white out of there. I guess it kind of makes an outline around it. makes it a little easier to see. But honestly, if you don't have a good eyesight, this is going to be hard to see on this red background. So uh, what you can do is use green felt for your dice rolling box or black even, or just use white or some other. But if you really want the high contrast, use the white. But anyway, Zargon dice are just kind of a little luxury item. But the thing about these, I just want to warn you. So these uh, Spiel Warren Saloon dice, are just slightly bigger, but it's barely noticeable. These are basically $1.60 each, because you tend to get them in packs of six. But he sells all these other colors. So you've got the green ones, which have like an extra hero shield on them. You've got the black ones that have an extra skull, blue ones that have an extra monster shield, yellow ones that have like double shields and double skulls orange that have you know double black shields in there too or i call them black shields but they're monster shields whatever um he sells all those different ones and then he's got ones that are you know just skulls or don't lack you know shields or they have different denominations of symbols well his are like a dollar 60 per die guess how much these cost these are $4.20 per die. I mean, they're really nice, but I was like, whoa. I really wanted to get some, but I thought, gee, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of a budget gamer. I mean, I like, I like this stuff, but obviously if money was no object, I'd just be buying all kinds of stuff. I'd be spending all my money on this one hobby, which I don't want to do. So I'll just warn you, if you go on there, I mean, yes, you can get more of these. If you're just getting them for yourself or for your friends, it's going to cost you quite a bit. So I hope you use them. $4.20 per die if you get six of them. Now, if you're printing like hundreds of these, see, the thing about Board Games Maker, so this is where I go. There's a lot of websites that will print your custom playing cards for you if you want, which a lot of people like to do for HeroQuest, rather than just print it on paper and cut it out with scissors or whatever. Um, if you're just making a, a set for yourself, it's going to be one price. But 
what Board Games Maker, Board Games Maker is like the board game equivalent of Make Playing Cards Company. Make Playing Cards Company, or Make Playing Cards, MPC for short, they just do cards. Whereas Board Games Maker will make tiles and uh, chits and game boards and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Not just cards and boxes for cards, which is what the other site does. So you can get tokens, game pieces. They're basically designed to help you like create a prototype of your own game and then just make it and sell it now the problem here is if you're making like fan mods for hero quest you're not going to be selling these things because they're derivative you know i'm not a lawyer or anything but i would think that that would be frowned upon if you were doing that so if you're making your own game and you're trying to sell it Okay, makes sense that you'd make, you know, hundreds or thousands of copies, in which case per unit would be pretty cheap. But if you're just going to make a set for yourself, yeah, this is probably not where you're going to go unless you just really want to do it. The other option is just to hope somebody on Etsy or somewhere like makes it for you and sells it to you at a decent price. But yeah, just think about that before you do it. But since people asked, I'm going to go ahead and show you. Because a Spiel Warren saloon guy does not make black dice with red images. He makes these black with white images, but these, so there's four skulls, one white shield, and, and one black shield. So it's more likely you'll get a skull. So these are different than these. These are the same as the white uh, dice in terms of like what you could get, the distributions of these faces. So. The way these are created, I'll just show you on the website here. So let's say you're here, you're on I can just get it kind of on screen so you can kind of see what, what we're doing here. Yeah, it's really cold today. Okay, so you might need to zoom in to kind of see what that is, but let's just say you're looking at it here. And what you want to do is you're going to go up to the top here where it says dice. Now this is just the quick start. If they change this around, it'll be different. So you click on dice. Just follow with me here. So I could do is just actual size. There we go. So I chose custom dice, uh, six-sided. That's the first thing I did. Start your design. And then you've got these choices here. So if you were trying to do square dice like the remake have, you would probably want to do these 16 millimeter straight edge dice. So the straight edge society. Just kidding, CM Punk and all that. So you click on these 16 millimeter round corner dice is what I did and there you can see you got your options so you can change the color you've got white yellow red you got the little sample image there uh, blue black and like uh, teal or turquoise, blue green. Just kind of being slow on me there. Hopefully we're not having any issues here. Let me just check the stream. So we're just looking at custom dice here. Creating your own custom Zargon dice, which are just like your basic HeroQuest combat dice, except that they're a different color, just so that you can distinguish the Zargon or Morkar players dice from the hero players dice, if you're playing together. Sorry, I'm just checking the stream here. 
Okay, so welcome to Go With Him, Striker667, our members in the chat there. Oops, <laughs> sorry about that. Just ask people if they have questions, it's always classic. Okay, so back to what we were doing here. So I'm on uh, boardgamesmaker.com. And again, this is not a endorsement or anything. I'm just showing you what I did since people were asking. So let's say I'll pick a black background. And I actually already have one made here, but let's just uh, start our design. And as you can see, it's $6.50 if you just wanted to make one die. So it's best to make a lot of them. And then you have over here, you've got see each of the faces of the die or dice, as they call it in the UK. And it just says drag and drop your image here. I recommend using bigger images with a big, like a lot of empty space around it. Like I'll just create a PNG image. Now, if you're working with layers, so you're, let's say in Photoshop, it's, I think, uh, what's it called? It's not PSD, it's something else. But in paint.net, which I use, it's PSD. You wanna flatten the image first before you drag and drop it here. You can also upload images. You can uh, just grab it off your hard drive. Since I've already got one going, I'm just gonna show you what I got here. So I've got this saved project already here. I'm gonna continue. Okay, so if you can see that, again, these are not, well, these particular ones are not the classic images. This is more like the remake. I prefer the classic, honestly. So considering the cost, I'm probably not gonna make these, but if you wanted to, this is what you would do. So you can change the color of the dice. So that's what they look like. Yellow, blue, cyan, or I guess that's not really cyan, it's teal, turquoise. So I have black with red. But I mean, you know, uh, I've upped it, uploaded other types of images, so you could, let's say, uh, do black. So let's say there's black. Here you got the hero shields. Notice the um, upside down uh, monster shield or black shield. But you could make it like that. Lots of different things you could do. And here you could easily create those um, special dice. So you could say, okay, well, now there's four skulls. So there's more of a chance of an attack landing when you roll. Or you could decide to, let's say you want them to be defensive dice. So you could say, maybe there's more of a chance of a hero shield being rolled. Or you could say you want it to be like monster defense dice. So boom, twice as much chance of a black shield. There's all kinds of things you could do. Um, then let's say maybe you want to use like white symbols. So let's see, what's that? Oh, that's wrong one. There we go. You can do white. That's not the right one. There we go. So you can't really see it in the menu, but yeah, so you could do it like that. And so oh, that's a little off center. So if it's off center, you can click edit. I don't care that much, but I mean, you are paying quite a bit for these, so you might as well make them as perfect as you can. So you edit and it should allow you to shift the image over slightly. Oh, I overcorrected in the wrong direction. See when it's white, it's, it's kind of hard to see. So let's try that. There we go. You play with it until it, it looks right to you. 
because you're going to wait a while for it to be delivered and you want it to be as good as you can. Let's say you were trying to create something similar to those Spiel Saloon Warren, uh, Spiel Warren Saloon, I keep goofing it up, dice. So his dice, uh, the black dice he uses are like attack dice, so they have more skulls on them. So let's say you'd put, whoops, nope, that'd be a monster die, monster defense dice. There, now it'd be like an extra attack die. But for his blue dice, he would have, see, an extra monster defense. So it's pretty easy. Now, his green, these aren't quite the same green as he's using. But you could do oh there you go we just highlight it that's how you see it sorry <laughs> I feel like kind of a noob sometimes in front of the camera okay so there's defense dice so it's pretty easy and then when you're all done you just go to the next step whoops I did that wrong so to do defensive dice you'd want an extra white shield so it'd be like that so let's say you're you go to the next step and then you can actually put text on there too if you want to i never do but they actually do sell uh, inscribed dice but the inscribed dice are only white so it didn't quite fulfill my needs so there you've got you can zoom in. You've got like a 3D render of what it'll look like in your hand. So it's pretty cool. And then when you're done with that, you're saying, yes, I confirm, blah, blah, blah. You add it to your cart, and then you order it. Give them your information, and I'm not going to put my private information on there, but it's pretty simple. So let's see in the chat if anybody had any questions about that. That's how you make your own dice through Board Games Maker. Now I've heard of people like cutting blocks out of wood, or you can even just buy blank dice that are just plastic, that are just blank. And you could draw on them, you could paint, you could get little stickers and put the stickers on the faces. You can do all kinds of things. So it's just, again, it's, it's whatever you want to do at your gaming table, what you like what your desires are for making custom game pieces. Now, if you're going to make a game to sell, you know, you probably want to do more quality control than I usually do. And you're probably going to be ordering in large numbers. So you do one set to see how it looks. And then once it's good, you do your multiple sets. But yeah, don't sell custom hero quest stuff. Just give it away. All right. So let's switch back to where we are now okay so I was looking at the forums here on uh, yield in not a lot of news happening in the hero quest world it's uh, pretty quiet these days which is fine it's just that um, I think March 1st is when they're supposed to be getting more of the guardian knights and so that's when I'm hoping that I'll get mine sometime in March. It's just that little uh, expansion of, you know, two heroes and a couple of cards. Well, one thing I wanted to do this time, which it's not a big deal, but it's never, you know, I've never really done a, a fully interactive game on here. I thought, why not? We could give it a try. We only have a few people here, but hey, that gives you a lot more power, right? So what we're going to do, I think, is let me just do some things here. Yeah, let's let's go back to that. So I've got these uh, HeroQuest books. These are written by Dave Morris. And he's a pretty cool guy because he wrote these back in the 90s for official HeroQuest. So they're published through, let's see, Corgi imprint. 
Corgi books and you can see there's the little world map. The HeroQuest world is loosely based on the Warhammer world, which is the copyright of Games Workshop used with their permission. So you can see it's vaguely like he's created his own stuff. And on his blog, which you can look up if you want, he talks about like the process that he used when he made these. He wrote these books and they gave him instructions and basically allowed him to do whatever he wanted. But over time, they basically said, yeah, the Hero Quest world is basically the Warhammer fantasy world. And so his, like, the geography in his books makes no sense now. <laughs> Unless you imagine that, like, the map is not to scale and some of the things are missing. Because Seeley's got, like, the Sea of Claws, which is now called the Sea of Talons and the new Hasbro Hero Quest stuff. But whatever, if you just enjoy it for what it's worth. So in these books, he will tell, um, there's a narrative story. So he'll tell an adventure, just a regular book, which I could read on here, but I'm not sure that I want to at this time. And then, except in the first book, he doesn't have this, but he'll have um, an actual like hero quest adventure that you would use with the board game, like a solo quest. And they're pretty easy. And then the third part is he will have like a choose your own adventure. And I thought, hey, we could do one of these. You want to? Well, I'm going to do it anyway. And if nobody says anything, I'll just come up with my own thing. And we might have to simplify it just because if nobody has any ideas, we'll just go with what we do. So the, there's the wizard one. You've got to manage all these spells. Okay, that's a little more work. This one, you've got four heroes. So you've got to keep track of like, what order they're in and what they can do. I like how the illustrations are basically straight out of the board game. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention um, Dave Morris. So what he did was um, several years back, he actually released all of his books for free. Like a lot of people were like, well, where can I get a scan of these books? Cause they're so hard to find. They're so expensive. I got a pretty good deal on them, but I had to wait forever to find a good deal. Well, the complete texts are on his blog. So just look up Dave Morris fantasy Hero Quest blog, and you'll find it. And he has download links for all of them. Now, some of them, I guess they go through like a Google package or what do they call whatever they call that. You have to request access. He's a cool guy. He'll he'll respond back and give you access. The only thing that's missing from his scans are the uh, illustrations, because these illustrations are owned by Milton Bradley Hasbro, I assume. I think he has some original illustrations instead of the the Hero Quest ones that are in these books. Like so. I mean that's the short sword from the European version. This is basically European Hero Quest. So he has his own illustrations and he also leaves out the solo quests. So running the gauntlet is in here and then a growl of thunder in here. But you can find those on Yield and you can find them on Hero Quest by Phoenix. Uh, dot yield end dot com. But it was cool of him to release his books to the public. I think that was a nice gesture. So don't no cheating and following along. <laughs> no, no reading ahead, I should say. So I figure we'll do Tyrant's Tomb. See how far we get. If my voice holds out. I do have my throat lozenges. Cheers, dead gamer. If you're listening, buddy. Shout out to all the people keeping the Hero Quest flame alive these days. The only other thing you need besides this book, I mean, you don't need the miniatures, although I've got them here. You don't need, uh, you know, the, the hero cards. At best, you would need a pencil and paper. I mean, assuming that you're not going to write in the book. I mean, I'm not going to be that strict about it. Let's see, where's the character sheet? There's a character sheet in here somewhere. There we go. So that's what it looks like. So you got your body, mind, combat, and speed. So now other than the combat and speed, so there's no rolling combat dice, it's just a regular die. So I've got these game dice. They put the numbers on there instead of reading the pips. 
Um, yeah, you've got items, maximum of six. Notes and code words. I mean, I guess you could photocopy this or you could just write it on a text file. And that's all you got to keep track of. You know, his weapons and things. And you've got these little sections. So it's a little more involved than just a choose your own adventure. But uh, let's check the chat one more time. Because basically what we're going to do here is, if you're willing, we're going to be having a striker. We're going to have you guys make the decision. So I'll put it out there. I'll give you a little bit of time to decide. And then we'll uh, we'll move on and we'll see if we win or if we get killed. Because <laughs> that's usually how these things go. Okay, rules of the adventure. Let me just adjust my camera here so I can see what's going on. Oh, here we go. There, now we can see you guys, what you're doing. So we've got uh, Duahani. Go with him and Striker667. Okay. All right. Well, here we go. So characteristics. You have four characteristics. Body measures the amount of physical injury you can endure. Keep track of your body score, which can vary as you are wounded. See, we should have somebody, uh, one of you, keep track of uh, body points. <laughs> you don't have to if you don't want to. Keep track of your body score, which can vary as you are wounded. If body is ever reduced to zero, you are dead. Lost body points can be healed by magical means but no spell or item will ever take your body score above its initial level. So you can see it's based directly on the board game and how the board game does things. So I'm just going to keep a little tally here. So you've got body eight. Mind represents the mental and, and psychic resilience. Okay. This characteristic measures your resistance to hostile sorcery. Keep track of your mind score. If it ever reaches zero, this means you've literally died of shock. <laughs> okay. Again, I'm just reading it here for straight from what it gives you. I think these books were intended basically for 10, 11 year old boys. So anyway, with some passing familiarity with the board game, at least combat indicates your ability to fight. This usually remains the same throughout the adventure, but can be changed if you lose a weapon or gain a better one, perhaps. Having your combat score reduced to zero is unlikely to occur and does not indicate death. Well, thank goodness. Speed is an indicator of dexterity and reflexes as well as movement rate. If your speed is ever reduced to zero, is reduced to zero, you must you have been immobilized and must abandon your quest. Okay. Initial values for each of the four characteristics are already given on the character sheet on page 77. So we'll just note that 77. Permission is granted for you to photocopy this character sheet for your use while playing the treasure of Changor Khan. Thank you guys for that. Thank you, Dave. Fighting. When you fight an opponent, the battle is considered to take place in rounds. Every round, you get an attempt to strike an opponent whom you're fighting. To do so, you must roll equal to or less than your combat score on one dice. See, now in the UK, they call it one dice. Um, in America, we call it one die. Six-sided die, d6. Okay, so equal to or less to, to be successful. For instance, if you have a combat score of four, then you'll need a one to four on the dice to hit your foe. If you succeed in scoring a hit, this inflicts the loss of one body point. Your enemy will also get a chance each round to strike back at you. Of course, you must roll dice for them, and any blow that they land will cost you one body point. Remember that if a character's body points are reduced to zero, that character is killed. Okay. Multiple opponents. When you encounter a group of foes, all of them will get a chance to hit you every round. But regardless of how many opponents you are fighting, you yourself can make one combat roll per round. This means that multiple opponents are very deadly, and you must be careful. Parrying. Instead of attacking in any given round, you can also try to parry. You must decide this at the very start of the round before rolling the the dice for any of the attacks for that round. You must have a weapon in order to parry. Makes sense. 
To parry, you will need to roll one or two on the dice. So one or two is parry. Combat equal or less. Monsters do not parry. So really, you don't have defense dice. You just have to get combat score. Let's see. You succeed in scoring a hit. Am I reading that right? Huh. So when you attack them, as long as you were successful in your attack, you score a hit. Interesting. So it's just slightly different than what you're used to if you're just playing Hero Quest. Monsters do not parry. Fleeing. Sometimes you will be given the option of fleeing from a battle. Okay. This might not seem exactly heroic, but discretion is sometimes the better part of valor. <laughs> and by retreating, you will even find a better place to make a stand. You might even find a better place to take a stand. If you choose to flee, try to roll your speed or less on one dice. Failure means that you lose one body point before getting away. Success means you manage to escape unscathed. Encumbrance. You can carry a maximum of six items at one time. If you come across an item which you are already, when you are already at your limit, you will have to discard something to make room for it. Note that you start off with a sword. Okay. And if this is lost, you must deduct one point from combat until you find another weapon to replace it. Okay. All right, let's get started. So all that boring stuff, you just want to jump into the game, right? That's how I always felt about these things. And really, you could just pretend that all that stuff doesn't matter and just read the story. But, you know, if you want to do it right, it's an interesting challenge on, on the honor system. Begin by writing your item, the items you carry on your character sheet. You have a sword, okay, a bow, and a money pouch, okay? So that's three items, containing 10 silver pieces. So none of this gold stuff. I guess you're a small time barbarian still. The money pouch only, contain, only counts as a single item no matter how many coins it contains. Well, that's great. So Shadowversary would be happy about that. You are in one of the many feeded taverns of Runeport, a wretchedly isolated town on the southern coast of Charlissia. Charlie Seox, or Charlie's Socks, as the native non Britannians mockingly call it. You came here in search of adventure, but the most adventure you have had so far is in avoiding the rats, pickpockets, and drunken gangs of off duty soldiers that infest the narrow cobble streets. I, I also like how he will occasionally sprinkle in like these uh, fancy words. So I guess the young kids that are reading this book will like be like, Daddy, Mommy, what do these words mean? And they have to look it up in a dictionary. Give them a little education. So that's the map, eh? Yeah. He didn't want to part with it. Oh, I have to do all these voices. I had to take a few of his fingers as well. Wonder what the red smudge was. You look up, intrigued by this snippet of obviously villainous conversation. At the next table sit two... Small, furtive-looking men with three ears, seven scars, and an eye patch between the two of them. They are bent over a torn scrap of parchment. If you approach them to find out what they're up to, turn to 25. If you eavesdrop for a bit longer, turn to 39. If you go to the bar to get yourself another drink, turn to 53. See, this sounds like Joe Maginello's quest. It really does. Okay, so guys, in the chat, everybody wake up. <laughs> What should we do? Should we approach these uh, weird guys to find out what they're what they're up to? Should we eavesdrop a little bit longer? Careful about dropping those eaves. Or should we go to the bar and get ourselves a drink? Chat room, I'm talking to you guys. What do you think? Now, if anybody on the Discord is watching... Okay, we're never going to get the adventure started if nobody participates here. I 
should have a little voting thing. Okay, so should we do A, approach the table, B, continue to eavesdrop, or C, get a drink? If you guys don't choose, I'm just going to pick one. Because I don't know. I haven't read ahead, so I'm not sure which is the right one, quote-unquote, or the best one. Anybody? See, now, if we were a big popular channel, we'd have, like, so many responses we couldn't even decide. Okay, well, I'll just I'm just gonna pick one then if nobody has a has a choice here. They're talking about a map. You're a big barbarian. I think probably what he would do is he would just uh, he would just walk up and ask him what's going on. They probably say like what's to ya and maybe you'll get into a fight. Bloodstained map. Okay, so let's go to 25. You loom over the table where the weird pair are sitting. You look up. They look up, greeting you in unison with a cry of, Beat it, you big barbarian buffoon. Now that is not polite. <laughs> so you can imagine like Arnold Schwarzenegger as uh, Conan the Barbarian in this scene. If you decide the, to teach the two rogues a lesson in manners, turn to 80... <laughs> So now, are you a hero, or are you just a guy that does whatever he, he wants? If you insist on joining them, <laughs> turn to 93. If you'd rather go off and seek adventure and treasure elsewhere, turn to 66. So the title of the story is The Treasure of... The Treasure of Chungar Khan. This is a solo adventure for the Barbarian... Let's see. Yeah, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of guidance. But you are looking for treasure. Oh, Striker's painting. Okay, no problem, man. You go ahead and keep on painting and uh, make it beautiful, whatever you're doing. Okay, so I don't know. I'm kind of inclined to teach these guys a lesson. But what's going to be the point? I'm going to beat them up and take their map. What if I can't read? <laughs> You know, so I probably have to have to negotiate. I have to just tamp down my natural uh, testosterone, you know, adrenaline uh, cocktail here and just uh, let's insist on joining them. Now, these guys might try to stab me in the back later, I suppose. I'm just trying to imagine all the scenarios, but this was made for kids. So let's see. Ninety three. You hold your tankard over the map and start to tilt it. I shouldn't leave that where beer might get spilled on it, you say casually. Could ruin an old map like that. <laughs> so you're a big jerk. Mouths gaping in horror, they stare at the tankard. And then at you, be careful, cries the fellow who has an ear missing. Of course I'll be careful, you say, squeezing into the seat beside him. Your shoulders are so broad that they are pushed right up against the wall. What do you want, then? Asks the one wearing the eye patch, relaxing slightly as you set the tanker down. Another drink would do for starters, you reply, tipping the tanker to show it is empty. There wasn't anything in it, says the one-eared man with a gasp of outrage. You scurvy mongrel! Now, now, you say, pulling the map across the table for a closer look. That's no way to talk to your new partner, is it? You can just imagine, like, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> That's no way to talk to your new partner, is it? <laughs> All right, I'm not going to do the voices. Okay, turn to six, 166. So it's got a little bit of, little bit of comedy at the beginning, depending on your choices. I like it in games where they can give you just off-the-wall uh, responses. Okay, your newfound cronies are called Grinch. Uh, he's a mean one. And uh, Grivoice. Grivoice? At least, those are the names they give you. After an initial reluctance in coming to terms with the new situation, you have to cuff Grinch for trying to slip poison into your tankard. They begin to accept you as their partner. Then you drop the bombshell. Boss! They cry together. Why should you be the boss? 
because I've got the map and I'm keeping it, you reply reasonably. Now tell me the whole story. They grumble, but finally seem to accept this further turn of events. All right, says Grinch. It's like this. Hundreds of years ago, there was a geezer in charge of the whole of Norska, and probably a lot more as well. Evil as an old crow he was, and more money than you could stuff down a dragon's gullet. When he died, they buried him with all his loot, right on the very edge of the world. Or at least the map, puts in Gree voice. Yeah, anyway, he had this pact with a snake goddess, see? So no one dared even so much as one gold take so much as even one gold coin away before they sealed the tomb, too afraid of the goddess's curse. Sorry, I'm trying to read this with a uh, throat lozenge in my mouth here. And you too, you ask, why aren't you afraid of the goddess's curse? We paid an old scribe to check out the legend, supplies Grievoice. We wanted to know the exact wording of the curse. Apparently, anyone who plunders the term will suffer eternal damnation. Wow, he looks at you, waiting for the light to dawn. Must be too late in the evening, you have to ask, and... Well, what do you think, he says, spreading his hands. In a profession like ours, eternal damnation is sort of an occupational hazard, as you might say. Reckon we can forget about collecting wings and ARP when we turn up our toes. Might as well get a bit of cash to cheer us up in our declining years, though. This is... <laughs> if you... This is dark. If you want... If you still want to accompany them to the tomb, turn to 11. If you want to de if you are deferred by this talk of a curse, you might prefer uh, looking for easier pickings somewhere in the back streets of Runeport. Turn to 66. Well, I guess, uh, you know, as a barbarian, you might be a little superstitious, but what if you don't believe this particular... Uh, idea you know this particular snake goddess has any power you think ah no big deal are you brave or are you foolish well what do you think guys should we take them to the to should we go with these guys to the tomb curse or no curse or should we get out of there go back to the streets of runeport i feel like there'd be another adventure i mean what is a hero i mean uh he goes even if he's afraid. So if you're not going to make a choice, I'm going to decide. And I'm going to say, let's let's go with, with him to the tomb. Okay, so we're going to 11. If anybody has any objections, you just let me know. You give a howl of laughter, which astonishes them. But how about you, says Grinch? Aren't you put off by the curse? We Norsemen revere true gods, harsh, uncompromising, uncaring monsters, every one. As long as we die in battle, we are guaranteed a place in the mead hall of Irg the Allfather, god of the slain. I pity this snake goddess if she cares to dispute possession of my soul with grim Irg. I'm probably not saying these words right, but yeah. Spoken like a true barbarian warrior, now you must back up your words with bold action. Note the co code word Psalms on your character sheet, and then turn to 156. Psalms. Okay, so that's a clue. All right, let's go to 156. See, now you could just write down all these numbers, and then you could recreate the whole adventure if you wanted. But I haven't been doing that, and I'm not going to start now. Of course, you can just replay the recording after this. This will, of course, go up on YouTube when we're all done. <laughs> yeah, okay. Remember to record the map on your character sheet. Oh, I, I forgot. Thank you, helpful narrator. Thank you, Dave. Remember to the, record the map on your character sheet. Guard it with your life, since you cannot complete the quest without it. You have a long journey ahead of you. If you have... Some money in which to buy supplies, turn to 26. We actually do. If you have no money or prefer to conserve it in case of later need, turn to 40. Well, we do need supplies. And speaking of supplies, I just need to take just a quick break here. I'll be right back. So we are reading The Tyrant's Tomb by Dave Morris. 
Hero Quest novel from let's see, I believe 1990, 1993, 1993. Yep. All right, I will be right back. Please. Thank you for your patience. Okay, we are back. All right, thank you for joining us here tonight on Hero Quest Fans. We are reading a novel. It's actually a game book, you could say. Part novel, part uh, game. All fun, hopefully. All right, and this is The Tyrant's Tomb by Dave Morris. Continuing on from where we were. So we do have uh, 10 silver coins. Do we want to buy some supplies? I'm thinking we probably should. So I'm going to go ahead and make an executive decision. Unless anybody else wants to chime in in the uh, chat. Because really, wh what do we have? I mean, we've got a bow, a sword, a map, 10 pieces of silver, and a clue. That's it. So let's get some supplies. We're going to 26. And these are paragraphs. This isn't like page number because there's multiple parts to the book, as I pointed out. There's the narrative, straightforward story, and then there's the quest, and then there's the choose your own adventure. So, and I've never, this is the first time I've gone through this. Okay. You scour the stalls of the marketplace, finally narrowing down your selection to just a few choice items. They could come in handy during the trip. A water flask costs two silver pieces. A jar of healing salve costs 17 silver pieces. Okay, so we only have 10. So we can't afford that. Maybe unless we arm wrestle for some money or something. A silver arrow costs 10, 10 silver pieces. A sprig of garlic costs one silver piece. A lantern costs one silver piece. The healing salve, which we can't afford, will restore one lost body point when used. There's enough in the jar for three uses. Having made your purchases and crossed off the money, turn to 40. Well now, this being the, uh, the fake Middle Ages or whatever, you think that we could uh, haggle with the guy. Let's see, 17 silver pieces. We might lose some money, but what we could do is we could maybe get just enough for one healing or two healings and not pay the full amount. Of course, you have eight body points. Are you really going to need that much? A water flask you would think would be important for a trip. But let's see, what would be 17 divided by 3? You're always supposed to round. It's about six. How about this? We'll get, uh, we'll spend enough for one, one healing of salve. So that'll be six gold. We'll get the water flask. That'll be two. We're almost, uh, full of items here. We got five items now. And then, yeah, we can't afford the silver arrow. That would take all our money. Sprig of garlic. But for uh, for uh, spices, or are we going to be worrying about vampires here? A lantern. A lantern would seem really useful. Let's go with that. Lantern. That's one more gold. That's nine, so we have one left. Okay, so one silver piece. 
We'll just cross that off. Okay, so now we have, these are our items. So item number one is the sword, two is the bow, three is the pouch with one silver coin in it. Um, oh, wait a minute. Four is the map, five is the solve. Oh, it's gonna be either gonna be the water flask or the lantern. Hmm. Darn. Well, I guess we got to make a decision here. Only six items. You know what? Forget the solve. We've got eight body points. You're the barbarian. I mean, we may get into lots of fights for all we know, but I think we'll make it. So no solve. So that gives us six back. We'll take the lantern. We'll take the water. And that'll be our six items. And so we'll have seven silver left. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, so sword, bow, money pouch with uh, seven silver inside it. Map, water flask, and lantern. So we're going practical. It's not much for a journey, but who knows what else he might have. Maybe he can live off the land or something. Okay. Have made your purchases and crossed off the money, go to 40. So here we go to 40. Again, Tyrant's Tomb by Dave Morris. All right. Yeah, anybody want to add anything to the chat, feel free, please. Okay. 40. You set out from Runeport. In the early morning, under a heavy sky that looks like a slab of shale, clouds scud morosely ahead of a damp wind that promises rain later in the day. Cresting a, a grassy bluff, you stand surveying the wasteland that lies ahead. To your right, gleaming like a tarnished silver plate, stretches the watery morass of the Marius de Perdue, the so-called Swamp of Lost Souls. Sounds very Lord of the Rings-esque. The mortal remains of many brave men lie deep in those insidious quagmires. You turn your head to gaze directly west. A bleak vista of weathering fells reaches off towards the distant blue outlines of the massif de Giants, or Range of the Giants, whose ragged ice-capped peaks scrape the very floor of heaven. Ogres dwell there. Worse things wait beyond. Neither route seems inviting. Let's take a look at the map here. So where are we? Oh, there's Charlie Ox, Charlie Socks. So I guess we're somewhere in that area. Oh, there's the Massif de Giants, the Giants. So we're like in this area. Okay. Um, ogres dwell there. Worse things wait beyond. Neither route seems inviting. There is one other way you might travel to the tomb, and that is to head directly south to the coast. There you could get a ship to take you west and drop you at one of the depot towns on the fringe of the Great Desert. Of course, passage on a ship costs money. Well, we do have seven silver left. Of course, who knows how much it'll cost. So we, if you take the route through the swamps, turn to 106. If you decide on a, a direct route, straight across the mountain range, turn to 67. Well, you're in good shape. Maybe you could do it. If you strike out southwards uh, towards the coast, turn to 76. So immediately I'm getting flashbacks to Lord of the Rings here. And it's like, well, he could be copying it, in which case, you know, similar things will happen. Or he could be subverting it, meaning totally different things would happen. Let's see. So swamps, mountains, or take a ship. So the sea. Any anybody have any ideas? I have no clue. I guess whichever route we go, there's going to be dangers. Let's look at the map again. So mountains, swamp, or to the water. I think it's swamp monsters falling off of a mountain, mountain monsters, 
um, sea monsters. You know what? Striker made the first suggestion. Let's go with the C. Well, well done, sir. Well, I'm assuming, but okay. 76. Two days journey brings you to the coast and a dour little fishing village of closely clustered low eaved cottages. The locals stare at you as though you were a fiend from out of the gray mists of Nefelheim. You just get your boot into the door of the tavern in time to stop them bolting it. Apparently, they are not fond of strangers in these parts. Be gone! You're not wanted here! Murmurs the landlord, always murmuring. Be gone! You're not wanted here! Murmurs the landlord, confirming your initial impression. You force the tavern door open and stride in. I wish to hire a boat to take me west along the coast, you announce. Staring around at the unsmiling faces, there is no reply. Come now, you say. Is the fishing so good that no one here has the time for a short excursion? The landlord scowls. Aye, there's the rub. For none of us now dares take this vessel out on the sea, for fear of the sea serpent which haunts these parts. Ha, called that one. Why wouldn't there be sea serpents? It was sent by an old wizard who bore us a grudge, puts in an old fisherman. Now that now we are plagued night and day, and our very livelihood is threatened, declares another man. It will be the ruin of our village, says the landlord, shaking his head sadly as he evicts a regular customer who can no longer pay for his drink. <laughs> if you decide to help these desperate people, turn to 108. If you decide to follow the coast in search of another village, turn to 121. If you return inland to try another route, will it be through the Titan Halls, turn to 67, or up the Swamp of Lost Souls? Well, you are a hero, right? So if you get sidetracked, a little side quest, I mean, what's the big deal, right? And if you're a mercenary, think about it this way. They might give you some kind of reward, possibly, if you don't get killed. Maybe you'd win their support. Maybe they'd help you out with some information. So there could be something in it for you. I don't know. I'm thinking we should probably help the people, but anybody else have any suggestions? Should we help them fight the sea serpent? Should we just try a totally different village that doesn't have a sea serpent problem? Um, or do we t return inland to try another route? In which case, it would be the Titan Hills or the Swamp of Lost Souls. So it was back to our earlier choices, in other words. Help? Okay. Striker, taking the lead. All right. It sounds like uh, sounds like you're a hero at heart. Okay, help the desperate people. I I was kind of inclined to that choice anyway. All right, 108. You soon you soon learn that the sea serpent shows itself most often at moonrise, out among the sharp rocks off the coast. If you decide to go to face the monster in a rowboat, <laughs> that doesn't sound very good. I mean, how big is this thing? Turn to 153. If you think it'd be better to swim out, oh, even better, who do you think you are, Beowulf? Turn to 162. Uh, let's see. I mean, okay, so I guess this establishes he can swim. So swim or boat? Anybody? I mean, I'm kind of thinking of boat, because if he can swim anyway, you could just ditch the boat. If you had to, I'm going to say boat, if it, unless anybody objects. Rowboat. You get some exercise on the way. Because the serpent attacks boats, so that might be a way to. Yep, I agree. So Striker says boat. Let's go with it. That'll definitely draw him out. Want to antagonize him? It's like, what are you going to do? Sneak up on the monster? I mean, I don't know. Maybe you could. You're a hero through and through. Okay. No one is in a hurry to accompany you. But finally, an old man named Ramas agrees to row the boat. Oh, great. So an NPC is going to get in danger. You'll need both hands free to battle the monster, he says. You nod, admiring his bravery. Perhaps you would prefer to go alone to fight the sea serpent. But Ramas is right. At least he is an old man with most of his life behind him. <laughs> uh, that night, the two of you take a boat out among the rocks and wait. The sea is calm, a mirror of indigo glass. 
At last, the moon rises, creamy light spreading in gleaming veins across the water. Less than a minute passes. Barely has the moon's disk risen clear of the eastern horizon when a vast waterspout shoots out, heralding the arrival of the monster. Then its head lifts out of the sea, and for a moment you feel a sensation which any other warrior would know as fear. But to you it is only an urgent pumping of the heart, a quickening of the blood. Fear to you is the fuel for ferocity. Uttering a blood-curdling roar, you swing your sword against the serpent's flanks. And of course, you know, I could see this. Sea Serpent Combat 3, Body 5. Okay, so I guess we're going to uh, page 2 here. Sea Serpent Combat 3, Body 5. And just to reference your... We never gave the Barbarian a name, but I guess whatever name you imagined for him is his name. Y-O-U is his name. Uh, your combat is five, because we've still got the sword. So if we have roll a five or less, we're successful. If he rolls a three or less, he's successful attacking us. So we attack him first. If I understand this correctly. Okay. So we're just going to get our uh, dice rolling box out here. Got our d6. Okay, so we're attacking. Two. Okay, so two was less than five, so we were successful. So we did one body point of damage. So he has five, and he goes down to four. So that's him, or that's that's us. This is him. So that now the sea serpent is attacking. He has to get three or less. You didn't see that, but that was a five. So he failed. Okay. So now we are attacking him. It's just a fight to the death. Six. So we failed. Okay. Now he attacks. One. Uh oh. So he struck. So now we lost a body point. So we are down to seven. Okay. So we attack with the sword two. So we hit him. He's down to three. Sea serpent is attacking us. Three. Okay, he hit. Now we're down to six. Man. This is how combat goes. So now we're, um, yeah, we're attacking him. Five. Well, that's equal, so we hit him, so he's down to two. Almost got him. Sea Serpent attacks back. One. Ooh, he hit us. We're down to five. We're attacking the Sea Serpent. Five. Okay, we hit him. He's down to one. Almost got him. Last chance, Sea Serpent. Six. So he failed. All right. This will be finishing blow. Good stream to paint HeroQuest terrain pieces, too. Yeah, you can paint those uh, giant mountains or whatever. Six. Failed. Okay. He gets another swipe at us. Five. He failed. You can't see it. Here, just get it on the screen. That's a five. So he failed. So this battle is going on. Kill the sea serpent. Five. We got him. Sea serpent is killed. Okay. All right. Oh, we didn't keep track of the rounds. If you're still alive after five rounds, if you kill it before then. Oh, I wasn't keeping track. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Sorry, I did that wrong. Okay. So if you're still alive after five rounds, go to 60. So if that's the case, we were only at. We were down to seven.
rock and stairs to replace cardboard. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Striker's uh, working on a cool project there. All right, so let's go to 60. Yeah, next time I'll pay more attention to the fact that there may be more text after the battle. I was so excited about our first battle. Actually, one of these books, I did play one fight. Like, the wizard was fighting, like, this bat creature. But other than that, I've, I haven't done the combat yet. Okay, except for that one. So our first battle together, we survived. Okay, lifting its sinuous tail clear of the waves, the serpent brings it crashing down onto your boat, of course. The flimsy craft is instantly broken in two. You hear Romas give a shriek as he plunges over the side into the sea. So we should have killed the monster faster, I guess is what they're saying. There's no time to worry about him, though, since you have your own life to save. Aw. Plunging through the icy waters, you hastily discard everything which weighs you down. Cross off every item you have except for the map. You know, good thing we didn't blow a lot of money on stuff. Um, except for the map. Okay, so there goes the sword. There goes the bow. There goes the seven silver coins. There goes the water flask. And there goes the lantern. Darn. Then you struggle towards the shore. Luckily, the sea serpent does not pursue you. Obviously, it has swum, swum back to its submarine lair to lick its wounds. Well, maybe it won't bother the people anymore. You swim to the beach safely and lie there gasping, recovering your strength. You cannot return to the village. The shame is too great. Not only did you fail to kill the monster's promise, but you escaped with your life while poor Ramas did not. Then another thought occurs to trouble you. What about the map? Roll the dice. If you score 1 to 4, the map is all right, and you, have to you can continue on your way. If you get a 5 or 6, however, the ink has been obliterated by the salt water, and the map is now illegible, bringing your journey to an abrupt end. Oh, man. Well, guys, <laughs> I know. Sudden, sudden uh, uh, disaster. So uh, if I roll a 5 or 6, so there's more chance of success than failure. These are not trick dice, so... You gotta get one through four to continue on. Okay, three. All right, so we're okay. So the map is okay. 121. So we suffered a setback, but we're still, we're still there. All right, 121. The next day, sauntering westward along the cliffs. Ah, so we just decided to go that way. You spy a ship sailing quite close to shore. She has black sails and a figurehead in the form of a huge cackling crow's head. Peering intently, you can just make out the, the name painted on her bow. The Helderizer. A vessel of ominous aspect? Perhaps, but she is sailing the way you want to go. If you hail the Helderizer, uh, turn to 134. If you let her sail by preferring to continue your journey on foot, turn to 147. No weapons, yeah. <laughs> Well, you can still fight with your bare hands, just you're fighting with four instead of five, so there's you're not quite as strong. And as far as I can recall, we're at seven body points. If somebody watches his back and decides that we goofed up, you know, so be it. But it's our first adventure. Give us a break. All right. I'm going to make a executive decision. Um, let's see. Or maybe I'll just I'll open it up. So should we get on the ship? I'm thinking we should get on the ship. I mean, for all we know, it's full of pirates, but, you know, maybe we could uh, throw a weight around and figure figure something out. Should we take the ship? I'm going to say let's, let's take the ship. Worked out well last time, too. <laughs> yeah, we just got some bad rolls is all. Okay, turn to 134. And as far as I know, in these books, there's many possible endings. It isn't just one ending. But there's probably only one where you actually accomplish the mission of getting the treasure. Your urgent waving attracts attention aboard the ship, and a rowboat is dispatched. You hurry along the cliffs a short distance until you find a steep path which you can descend to the beach. The rowboat is manned by silent rowers, hunched like grave diggers over their oars. The bosun stands in the prow lank gray hair flapping in the salt breeze. 
When the boat is still a stone's throw from shore, he calls to you in a voice that is quiet but full of strength. So if you would come aboard our vessel, wade out through the waves to us. If you insist that he brings the rowboat in closer to shore, turn to 157. If you wade out to the rowboat as instructed, turn to 174. If you attack them, turn to 12. <laughs> Let's see. Um, wade out to shore. It almost sounds like a test. A stone's throw. I mean, is that uh, sea serpent still out there waiting to finish you off in the shallows? Um, why would they? Why would they come all this way just to fool you? Like psych, and then they row away. But it's going to set the mood for how you relate to each other. Should we? I don't know if attacking them is really that smart. Because what are we going to do? Go back to the ship? Um, I mean, do they have cannons or something? Can they blow us away? So we either go out to the rowboat or insist that they get, come closer. See, it seems like in the past we we got it. We kind of just uh, elbowed our way into a, an adventure by throwing a, our weight around. <laughs> just go to them, I think. Okay. Striker is the more courteous of the two of us. All right. So you wait out. So maybe he's he's learning humility is what the barbarian is doing. He's used to getting his own way, and now he's just kind of like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll meet you halfway. You struggle out through the surging waves and are hauled aboard the rowboat. Few words pass through you and the bosun as you return to the ship. You watch the backs of the oarsmen as they bend to their tasks, breathing, breath stimming, excuse me, breath steaming on the cold air. Aboard the Helldrazer, you are taken straight to see Captain Athscar, a huge white-bearded man whose ruddy face might seem jovial if it were not for his close-set eyes. His smile reminds you of ice over a pond, thin and treacherous. Tell me how it goes in the world, are his first words to you, eh? You are at a loss how uh, to know what he means. He turns and gazes at the land, dwindling now as the Helldrazer puts out to open sea. In former days, a strong monarch ruled there, he says, I... And in the lands across the ocean, too, he'd brook no opposition to his rule, crushed all contention with a fist of iron. You sound as if you admired this tyrant, you say. The captain nods. Feared him, too. A man should fear his liege. It teaches respect. There are no emperors like that now, though. Weak men fill the world. Splendor is humbled and glory is on its knees. What's called for now is a return to those great days of yore. This is worrying. The captain appears to be an errant madman. Okay. If you remain aboard, biding your time, turn to 27. If you dive overboard, turn to 41. If you threaten the captain's life, turn to 55. So they always give you the, uh, the violent option. So... Should we just uh, bide our time? Threaten him. <laughs> Just go for broke. All right. Nobody else objects. Striker. He likes that, right? Ah, he respects strength. You've got a point there. You've got a point. So you threaten the captain's life. Turn to 55. All right. Hopefully the barbarian's a good judge of character. With a snarl, you draw your sword. What sword? <laughs> I guess uh, I guess you uh, they gave you one. You draw your sword. I've had enough of this sheep dip, you say. Now under the helmsman. Now order the helmsman to put into shore, or you'll be swabbing the deck with your own entrails. To your amazement, Askar doesn't even try to reach for a sword. He gives a great bellow, like a sea lion, it comes at you with his bare hands, roaring for your blood. Well, <laughs> oops, <laughs> Captain Askar, combat five. Oh, so he's stronger than you. Body seven. The sailors just stand back and watch, not daring to get embroiled in such a vicious fight. If you overcome him or you flee, you have two options. Well, <laughs> I guess, uh, yeah, he 
I kind of thought maybe he would take it as a bluff as well, like he'd laugh it off. But So we've got to fight this guy now. Or do we want to run away? I mean, if we kill him, what? We, we become the captain? Is that how this works? So he's got combat five. Need to earn that respect. Yeah, that's true. All right. We'll, we'll see. Now, wait a minute. It sounds like he's attacking you. So I guess he gets the first attack. That sucks. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Let's just see what we've got here. So Captain Athscar. Okay, so... We've got four and seven. He's got five and seven. He's got a slight advantage. Okay. So that was his first attack. Three. He succeeds. We lose one. Okay. So we attack him. Five. We fail. Darn. Okay. He attacks us. Five. He succeeds. We get down to five. We attack the captain. Four. Okay, we took it. Scored a hit on him. He's down to six. He attacks us. One. He So he gets a hit. We're down to four. We attack him. Six. We fail. Nothing. He attacks us. Six. He fails. We attack the captain. One. Okay, we hit him. He's down to five. So five to four. He attacks us. Two. We're down to three. We attack him. Five. We fail. I'm worried we're not earning to redirect points here. Yeah. Parrying. Yeah, we forgot to do the parry thing. Now, does it just give you that one option before we attack at all? Or is it... You think you could parry any time during the combat. You guys want to try to parry instead? Need to roll one or two. Of course, the other, the other problem is we don't have a weapon. I know it said sword, but we didn't have a sword. So we can't parry. Yeah. You're right. Good point. But thanks for bringing it up because, yeah, I forgot about the parrying. I was thinking like, oh, you can only do that if you... It would make sense that every round you could decide to do it if you wanted to. Maybe you could grab his sword and use it or something. <laughs> of course, then you could do anything you wanted. Okay, so where were we at? Took three. Were we on his attack or ours? Who's attacking? Do you remember Striker? Be honest. <laughs> I'm thinking it's his attack. Two men barehanded. Yep. Fight to the finish. All right. So he's attacking us. Four. Okay. So we're down to two. We're attacking him. Six. We failed. He's attacking us. Four. Uh, we're down to one. Even if we bought the salve, we wouldn't have it anymore. We're attacking him. Three. So he's down to four. <laughs> this could be the killing blow. Three. Ah, oh, we're dead. We're dead, guys. Is there any text? If you overcome him, if you flee. Well... The only thing we could have done is, can we just pretend that last one didn't happen and then we fleed, fled? Let's see, fleeing. Ah, so if you try to flee and you fail, you you take you get hit anyway. Yeah, it's the bad rolls, not the bad choices, or the good choices. 
So how about this? We will try to flee on our last hit there. So speed is three. So we have to roll one, two, or three, or we're dead. So this is going to be it. Six. <laughs> So even if we'd fled, we would have failed. All right. Sorry, guys. That was the end of our adventure. We got killed. Um, Tyrant's Tomb. And Striker, you know, I liked your uh, I liked your, your choices. I think it was my bad rolls that finished us off. Captain Athscar killed us. So does anybody want to go back and try again? Or, or how are we doing for tonight? Easy come, easy go. We could give it another shot. See, that took us about an hour. No, we could do another hour. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking. Let's just let's take a look at the chat here. See, since I don't have my copy of uh, Space Crusade, oh, we got some new people. Welcome to HeroQuest fans. So we've got Rogue Girl and Lenare and our usual Duani Striker. Go with him. You know what? Since we've got some new people, how about this? How about we'll start? I got no painting done. Well, Striker, why don't you take a take a breather? Get back to your painting. Uh, let's let's try another let's try another shot at this. Because I feel like I was just I was just starting to get to know the game, and then we got killed. So let's go back. Tyrant's Tomb, Dave Morris. Let's give it another shot. We'll give the new people a chance to make some decisions here. This is like a choose-your-own-adventure, essentially. So setting the stage, here's the, here's the world that we're in. Similar to the Warhammer fantasy world, loosely based. And you are the Barbarian. We are the Barbarian. And you are on an adventure called The Treasure of Chungar Khan. And I'm going to skip uh, the narration and just go right to the adventure. So you're in the tavern. You're hearing a couple of guys talking about something. You're in this place called, uh, let's see, you're in Runeport. You came here in search of adventure, but the most adventures you've had so far is in avoiding the rats, pickpockets, and drunken gangs of off-duty soldiers that infest the narrow cobbled streets. So that's the map, eh? Yeah, he didn't want to part with it. Had to take a few of his fingers as well. Wondered what the red smudge was. You look up, intrigued by this snippet of obviously villainous conversation. At the next table sit two small, furtive-looking men with three ears, seven scars, and an eye patch between the two of them. They are bent over a torn scrap of parchment. So should we approach them to find out what they're up to? Or eavesdrop, eavesdrop for a bit longer? Or go to the bar and get yourself another drink? Well, I don't know about you folks, but after, uh, after dying once, I kind of feel like I need a drink. <laughs> so that's what I would go with. Anybody else have any other options? What, what would you like us to do? Anybody in the chat, feel free to chime in, please. Striker, uh, you're painting, so don't you worry. Anybody? If not, I'm going for that drink. I don't know what they serve at this place. It might not be very good, but we could give it a shot. All right, we're going for the drink. Please drink responsibly. You go over to the bar, but the landlord merely stares at you scornfully and points to the the tariff scrawled in chalk on the wall behind him. This reminds you that you have spent nearly all your money and have only a handful of coins left. Soon you start looking for gainful employment. Not necessarily honest, just gainful. If you go over and join the two furtive rogues, turn to 25. If you leave the inn and go looking for adventure elsewhere, turn to 66. Ah, see, it's always the uh, down on his luck adventurer that uh, his uh, money purse gets low and he's got to 
seek some danger. Well, it looks like they're kind of pointing us back to the rogues. Or we could go looking for our other places. Should we uh, check these guys out at the table? Or should we go and try a different inn, different place? Anybody? Type your choice in the chat if you uh, have an opinion. I'm gonna I'm gonna just go up to him because I mean I guess we could go somewhere else but I feel like they're gonna loop us back in. Some of these books will do that. I mean you can have side adventures, but if you just try to avoid what you're trying to do, they'll they'll either loop you back or have something bad happen to you. Okay, you loom over the table where the weird pair are sitting. They look up, greeting you in unison with a cry of "Beat it, you big barbarian buffoon!" Now that is not polite. If you decide to teach the two rogues a lesson in manners, go to 80. If you insist on joining them, turn to 93. If you'd rather go off and seek adventure and treasure elsewhere, turn to 66. Let's see, so they give you another chance. Well, I think we tried being nice last time. <laughs> teach them some manners. Of course, we might have to fight these two guys. Of course, they're missing some ears and some eyes. It might not be much of a challenge. Who's up for a, a barroom brawl? I'm just going to make a decision. It might be the wrong one, but I'm just going to do it for entertainment's sake. Okay, let's teach them some manners. Sounds like they, uh, they uh, injured a guy to get his map, so maybe they're not that great of guys anyway. They might have it coming. You can meet out some justice at the end of your knuckles and you've got your sword so it's not like you're defenseless you open your mouth to give the lusty battle roar of your people but before you can even fill your lungs there are two viciously sharp knives raised towards your throat whoa the one-eared rogue shoves his face towards yours he only comes as far as your chest but that's near enough to smell his breath you've passed open sewers that were more fragrant we asked you nicely, he says. Now I'll say it in plain language. Shove off or you'll have to carve your liver out. Or I'll, we'll have to carve your liver out and pin it to your face. Wow. You go to reach for your sword, remembering too late that it is in the weapons rack besides the door, where all good customers are supposed to deposit their implements of war. Obviously, these two care nothing for such tavern regulations, in addition to their other crimes. If you tackle them barehanded, go to 107. If you look around for something to use as an improvised weapon, turn to 120. Now, I'm sick of fighting without a weapon. So two guys with knives. I'm going to say look for an improvised weapon. Anybody object to that? Maybe grab a bar stool or something. Let's go to 120. Look for an improvised weapon. Assuming they'll be polite enough to let us do that. The table is the only thing that comes to hand. <laughs> Bellowing like a mad bull, you wrench it up over your head and use it to clobber the two astonished thieves senseless. <laughs> then you pick up the map they were pouring over. Well, that was easy. You didn't even have to fight them. <laughs> it shows the region north and west of Runeport, the tract of miasmal swampland known as the Marias Derepidu, the hills of the massive Degeants and beyond a great plain which gradually declines into featureless wind-blown desert. You're about to cast the map aside when you notice something on the very western edge. It is a symbol in the shape of an ancient ziggurat, of the sort that great kings were buried under in times gone by. Next to it is, is a large golden disc, no doubt indicating treasure. As you sit pondering the map, the two rogues start to stir, giving weak groans. <laughs> So you didn't uh, you didn't kill them. If you leave the tavern while they are still unconscious, turn to 156. If you prefer to wait here until they come around, turn to 146 or 156, 146. So you beat these guys up. Have you earned their respect, or at least have you scared them into not trying to kill you this time? 
Hmm. I'm inclined to kind of figure what these guys will do. I mean, of course, if we've already read the map, what what do we need them for? But, you know, maybe they could help us out. I'm I'm thinking we should probably uh stay here. Or do you think we should leave? Anybody think we should leave? I'm just going to make a choice here. Let's wait till they come around. Okay. All right, 146. Sorry, Striker, you get your painting done there, buddy. Thanks for the feedback. Okay. They set up nursing the contusions caused when you hit them with the table. The one with the eye patch gives you a black look. Better put a raw steak on that, you say, or you won't be able to see anything at all by tomorrow morning. He snarls, but both have learned to be more respectful of you now. Also, you have their map. They get up warily up off the floor and sit down opposite you. What's your game, barbarian? says the other rogue as as the one lack the one lacking an ear. Same as yours, chum, you reply, folding the map and stuffing it inside your jerkin. I'm going looking for buried treasure. Me and my two partners, that is. You smile at them, letting them know who's boss, and put your empty tankard across the table. Mine's a pint, by the way. Turn to 166. Okay. The newfound cronies. Your newfound cronies are called Grinch and Gravos. At least, those are the names they give you. After initial reluctance and coming to terms with the new situation, you have to cuff Grinch for trying to slip poison in your tankard. They begin to accept you as their partner. Then you drop the bombshell. Boss, they cry together. Why should you be the boss? Because I've got the map and I'm keeping it, you reply reasonably. Now tell me the whole story. They grumble, but finally seem to accept this further turn of events. All right, says Grinch. It's like this. Hundreds of years ago, there was a geezer in charge of the whole of Norska, and probably a lot more as well. Evil as an old crow he was, and more money that you could stuff down a dragon's gullet. When he died, they buried him with all his loot right on the very edge of the world. Or at least the map, puts in Grivus. Well, anyway, he had this pact with a snake goddess, see, so no one dared... Take even so much as one gold coin away before they sealed the tomb. Too afraid of the goddess's curse. And you too, you ask? Why aren't you afraid of the goddess's curse? We paid an old scribe to check out the legend, supplies Grivus. We wanted to know the exact wording of the curse. Apparently anyone who plunders the tomb will suffer, quote, eternal damnation, end quote. He looks at you, waiting for the light to dawn. Must be too late in the evening, you have to ask, and... Well, what do you think, he says, spreading his hands. In a profession like ours, eternal damnation is sort of an occupational hazard, as you might say. Reckon we can forget about collecting wings and an arp when we turn up our toes. Might as well get a bit of cash to cheer us up in our declining years, though. If you still want to accompany them to the tomb, turn to 11. If you are deferred by this talk of a curse, you might prefer looking for easier pickings somewhere in the back streets of Runeport, turn to 66. So they keep giving us chances to turn around. I'm going to say just go for it. We tried this once before. <laughs> so unless anybody has any objections, I'm going to say let's go to the tomb. Curse or no curse. I don't believe in this curse myself. Let's turn back to 11. You give a wild howl of laughter, which astonishes them. But how about you, says Grinch? Why aren't you put off by the curse? We Norsemen revere true God. Harsh, uncompromising, uncaring monsters, every one. As long as we die in battle, we are guaranteed a place in the meat hall of Erg the Allfather. I pity this snake goddess if she cares to dispute possession of my soul with grim Erg. Spoken like a true barbarian warrior. Now you must back up your words with bold action. Note the code word Psalms. The code word is Psalms on your character sheet, and then turn to 156. So we've been over this part. So he pretty much laughs it off. He's got his own beliefs, which don't include snake goddess curses. All right. Remember to record the map on your character sheet. Guard it with your life, since you cannot complete the quest without it. 
You have a long journey ahead of you. If you have some money and wish to buy supplies, turn to 26. If you have no money or prefer to conserve it in case of later need, go to 40. I'm going to say we buy supplies. That's what we did last time. Of course, we ended up losing all of them, but what's the money for? So I say let's go buy supplies. Unless anyone objects. You scour the stalls of the marketplace, finally narrowing down your selection to just a few choice items that come in handy during the trip. A water flask costs two silver pieces, a, and we have ten, by the way. A jar of healing salve is 17, which we can't afford. I decided last time if we wanted to pay six, we could get one healing point instead of three. Because the healing salve is enough for three uses. So we just get like part of part of a dose. Uh, you can get a silver arrow for ten. That'd be all our gold or silver, excuse me. I keep wanting to say gold. A sprig of garlic is one silver and a lantern is one. So we've already got we can only hold six items. So we've got first we've got a sword, a bow, the silver pouch itself. We've got a map. So we've got two slots that we could buy. I'm inclined to think the lantern for sure. And the water flask seems logical. I mean, the silver, the silver arrow seems very specific. We have a bow we could fire it with, but that would be all of our silver. I feel like we should save a little bit of silver, just in case. Healing Salve would have come in handy during our last fight, but I thought, well, he's the Barbarian's got eight body points. Okay, so if, anybody, if nobody has any objections, I'm going to get the Lantern for one, and the Water Flask for one. So we now have eight silver left. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you've made your purchases, go to 40. You set out from room port in the early morning under a heavy sky that looks like a slab of shale. Clouds scud morosely ahead of a damp wind that promises rain later in the day. Cresting a grassy bluff, you stand surveying the wasteland that lies ahead. To your right, gleaming like a tarnished silver plate, stretches the watery morass of the Marias de Perdu, the so-called Swamp of Lost Souls. The mortal remains of many brave men lie deep in those insidious quagmires. You turn your head to gaze directly west. A bleak vista of withering fells reaches out off towards the distant blue outlines of the massive de giants, or a range of giants, whose ragged ice-capped peaks scrape the very floor of heaven. Ogres dwell there. Worse things wait beyond. Neither route seems inviting. There is one other way you might travel to the tomb, and that is to head directly south to the coast. There you could get a ship and take to take you west and drop you at one of the depot towns on the fringe of the Great Desert. Of course, passage on a ship costs money. Well, we do have money left. If you take the route through the swamps, turn to 106. If you decide on a direct route, straight across the mountain range, go to 67. If you strike out southwards towards the coast, turn to 76. Well, last time we uh, we went uh, over the water and we fought a sea serpent. Now, you guys, the newcomers, didn't know that necessarily, but I'm inclined to choose one of these others this time just to see where it takes us. So it's either the swamp or the mountain. What do you think? Swamp or mountain? Anybody have any preference? If not, I'm just going to pick one. Let me just check the chat here. We've got five people in here, and I know Stryker is doing any painting. Anybody else uh, doing anything? Anything interesting? Just listening to me. Hopefully that's interesting for you. All right, I'm just going to pick one. So 
again, I'm, I've got Lord of the Rings on the brain. Of course, we don't know what Dave Morris has, uh, has in mind. Let's say, looking at the map here, so we're in this area. These are the mountains. Depardieu swamps. Hmm. Let's try the swamps. It doesn't sound like much fun, but maybe it would be an adventure. So 106. Probably a swamp monster that we'll have to fight. How much you want to bet? Your boots squelch in the boggy heathland as you trudge into the northwest. Low clouds hang like city smog allowing only a sickly gray daylight to reach the ground. Trees grow in stunted shapes here and there, skeletal brown forms stretching despondently up from the waterlogged mire. Along the bare branches sit hunched black crows, croaking evilly to one another across the marshes. You pass tangled clumps of reeds which remind you of lank corpse hair. The cloying scent of mushrooms hang in, hangs in the air. At last you arrive at the edge of a wide mirror, to cross it, you will need a punt. Fortunately, there is an inn standing at the edge of the mirror, and from the post outside, there is tethered a long, flat-bottomed boat. As you approach the inn, the door opens, and a young man comes bounding out to meet you. Greetings, he cries, his cheerfulness incongruous in such a desolate spot. If you wish to cross Mithril Mirror, you, will come, you have come to the right place. You nod. Apparently so. If you are owner of that punt tethered there... You dip your fingers into your money pouch. How much will you charge for the passage? His smile dis he smiles disingenuously and sniffs the air. Time enough to discuss that over a stoop of ale beside the hearth. Hearth, excuse me. Evening is coming on, and there's rain in the wind. It will be more comfortable to rest at my inn tonight and travel on tomorrow. You glower at him. And how much will all that cost? He shrugs. Oh, let's say seven silver pieces. Normally it would be more, but today I'm in a merry mood and cannot be bothered to haggle. If I give you seven silvers, you'd have good cause to be merry, you retort. If you have the code word Psalms, turn to 168, and we do. Otherwise, you have the choice of paying the sum, he asks, or trying to argue him down to a lower sum. Or stealing the punt. See, they always give you the the last choice, the the rogue choice. Well, we do have the code word, so let's go ahead and use that and see what difference it might make. Psalms. Hang on a minute, matey boy, says Grievous, stepping forward to put an arm around the young man's shoulders. Can we have a private word with you? Adds Grinch, taking his arm and leading him towards the inn. In your office, like? The young man smiles uncertainly as they disappear inside with him. You wait less than half a minute, then Grinch and Grievous emerge alone from the inn. Well, that's that sorted, announces Grievous. He's giving us the punt. You stare at him suspiciously. Giving it? Just like that? Grinch returns your scrutiny with a sheepish grin. Yeah, what a generous bloke, eh? Shows there's still a bit of de decency left in the world, doesn't it? Not where you two are concerned, you mutter darkly. But nonetheless, you join them in the punt and head out across the mirror. Hmm. Suspicious. Late afternoon sunlight trickles half-heartedly across the water, creating a glint of pallid whiteness. As the punt slides on across the mirror, you catch sight of a small island in the middle. Just going to take a drink of water here. Cheers, dead gamer. He'd always have to take a swig of beer during his uh, longer videos. I was drinking iced tea, but switching to water this time of day. Okay. <clears throat> so, you catch sight of a small island in the middle. Stop to investigate, or should we press on? Small island. I mean, there could be all kinds of things on that island. I don't know. Anybody have any opinions? Should we check out the island or should we continue on? 
just going to make a decision here. I'm going to say stop to investigate. I mean, side quests are always fun, right? Unless there's like a huge monster that we have to fight there. If they give us the option to flee or not. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay. The prow of the barge nestles in amid the clumped reeds and touches solid ground. You leap ashore, landing with a damp squelch on the boggy turf. Ahead of, ahead of you looms a copse of closely grouped trees, which fills the interior of the small island. You can see nothing in the thick shadows that lie there. The scent of danger is in the air. You move forward warily, tensed for battle. The branches snag your clothing and mud sucks at your, toe, at your boots, but you press on. Suddenly, there is a figure ahead of you. His upper body is that of a muscular but overweight man, coarse hair covering his skin, but small horns sprout from his brow and his legs are like those of a goat. So is his smell. Satyr. Combat three, body three. Okay, so our first fight, first real fight this, this session. So he's got three and three. Um, now, that kind of reminds me, the, the monster cards in HeroQuest um, have this like furry guy with horns on it who's never identified. And I guess you could say he's like a beast man in the Warhammer mythos, like in uh, Battlemasters. But it might be him. The satyr's arms seem to be swelling larger and larger as you fight. Each round, add one point to his combat score up to a maximum of six. Wow. If you're still fighting when his combat score reaches six, go to 118. If you beat him before, then turn to 150. If you flee, make a note of the satyr's current combat and body scores before turning to 159. Okay. So last time we had some bad rolls and we weren't able to kill the guy very quick. Now he's only got three body. But what are we going to accomplish by killing this monster? Anything? I don't know. I'm inclined to say flee. Of course, if we uh, score anything above a three, we might take one hit of damage. But we're at full strength right now. Does anybody object to fleeing? All right, I'm going to try to flee. <clears throat> so we roll 1d6. If we get 1 through 3, we're okay. If not, we'll take one body point of damage. 3. Okay, so we're safe. So we fled. Go to 159. Discretion is the better part of valor, right? You crash back through the thickets with the lusty laughter of the satyr ringing in your ears. If you have the code word Psalms, turn to 176. Well, we do, so we'll go to 176. Might find something. Yeah, we'll see. The punt is gone. Oh, great. So they ditched you. You stare around frantically, then you catch sight of it far off in the dusk, heading rapidly towards the far shore of the lake. The treacherous pair have abandoned you. Well, I'm shocked. The satyr comes crashing through the undergrowth behind you. You should have a record of his combat and body scores. Resume your battle, but this time there is nowhere to flee. If you win, turn to 35. <laughs> oh, great. All right. So, well, we got to fight the guy anyway. And, of course, we're reading... Tyrant's Tomb by Dave Morris, Hero Quest Adventure. All right, so he's got three combat and three body. We've got eight combat and five body. Or I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Uh, five combat and eight body is what we've got. So we've got an advantage. He's coming at us, so it sounds like he attacks first. So if he gets three or less he'll hit us so he missed okay now we're attacking so we've got to get five or less okay we hit him he's down to two now every round his combat score goes up so he's now at four so he's got to get four or less 
Okay, so he hit us, we're down to seven. Okay, now we attack him. Four, so we hit him down to one. He's gonna attack us. He's gotta get five or less. So we're down to six. Okay, now this round he goes up to six. And we're attacking him. Five. Okay, we killed him. And now we did it just as he went to six. So let's see. If you win, turn to 35. You can see the dice that I didn't cheat. Okay. You stand over the body of the satyr. It was a close run thing, but in the end, it was your foe, not you, who will sup with Queen Hell tonight. You turn and peer into the darkness. Grinch and Gravis surprised you, scapering like that. Not that you didn't expect treachery, you just didn't think they'd leave without the map. The map! You feel inside your jerkin, but it has gone. What? Delete it from your list of items you're carrying. You've been robbed. And you never felt a thing. See, I thought that ended your adventure if you lost the map. Delete it from the list of items you're carrying. You've been robbed. You never felt a thing. Hearing your bellow of rage, Grinch and Gravos, or Grievous, however you say his name, peer back at the island and rock with laughter. The little beggars. You'd dearly like to make them pay. To think they had the temerity to trick a fearsome Norsken warrior like yourself. If only you could get your hands on their grubby necks, you'd show them the error of their ways. Maybe you can. You're a strong swimmer. It would mean abandoning all your belongings, but you might be able to catch up with the punt. If you try if you try that, turn to 45. If you have a bow and want to shoot at them, turn to 59. Well, we do have a bow. And uh, last time we had to lose all our stuff. I mean, we got to be smart about this, right? We don't have that silver arrow, because I don't know. They never really explained, was the silver arrow magic or just made of silver? So we've just got a regular bow. I say we try to shoot him. You want to snipe him? Anybody object? Let's give it a shot. You send an arrow whistling off into the twilight, but the light is poor, and even for you, it is a long shot. Roll a dice. If the score is one or two, you've hit. If it's three or more, you miss. Okay? So one or two is a hit. Uh, we missed. Okay, turn to 160. Good thing it wasn't a silver arrow. That would have been expensive. 160, okay. Hero Quest fans, never a dull moment. All right, <clears throat> 160. The arrow falls short. Far off in the gloom, Grinch and Grievous do not even notice that you've shot at them. You bite your lip angrily and start to turn away. Suddenly, a flash of glimmering whiteness catches your eye. To your astonishment, a slim, pale arm comes snaking up out of the black water to catch your arrow. A ripple of luminous bubbles forms a track towards the island. And you can only stand dumbfounded as a woman clad in sheer white samite rises out of the mirror in front of you. This is yours, she holds out the arrow. You take it. You cannot find any words. It's like the Lady of the Lake. Her laughter is like the tinkle of tiny glass bells. I'm the maiden of the mirror. I guess it is more like a swamp land. Beneath the water lies my palace of lunar marble, with its decorations of sky silver studded with star jewels. Join me there tonight. Be my guest. She offers you her hand. If you refuse her invitation, go to 169. If you accept, go to 178. If you, if you explain that you're on a quest, go to 184. Well, <laughs> I mean, she could be taking you to your death. Can you breathe underwater? How does that work? I mean, to me, if you explain the quest, I mean, that'll tell tell us where she stands. She could be a powerful ally or she could be an enemy. At this point, we don't know. I mean, she's giving hospitality, but if she's like a witch or something, why would she 
respect the rules. I'm just trying to think of all the fantasy tropes I can, you know. I'm going to say tell her about the quest. Anybody have any... Sounds like a hard pass. <laughs> um, you want to refuse? Don't tell her about the quest. Okay. All right. Just because some watery tart, you know, waved an arrow at you. Think you're a king or something. All right. Refuse or invitation. I'm going to have to fight her next. Let's see. She smiles, but it is not a look of pure goodwill. Too many refuse me nowadays, she murmurs. Too many are like you, preferring your grim war gear and your chaos battles over the sweet delights of true enchantment. Well then, so be it. If you will not enter my world now, nor will you ever again. She stamps her foot lightly in the rushes and turns, slipping off into the water like a fish. The water closes over her head and she is gone. Hmm. You ponder her parting words. They had an ominous ring to them, rather like a curse. For a moment, your skin crawled, but that might simply have been some superstitious dread. Even so, uh, feeling it to be unwise to be to part from the strange maiden on such a sour note, you think it's best to try calling her back. You step forward into the water, or rather you don't. You step onto the water. Gazing down at your feet, you can hardly believe it. Instead of sinking into the mirror, you're standing on the surface. It feels like standing on a huge sheet of rubber. That was what the maiden meant then. She has cursed you so you can never enter water again. You laugh delightedly. She meant this as a curse, but you see it as a blessing. Now you can walk across the mirror in pursuit of Grinch and Grievous and give them apt desserts for their treachery. Interesting. <laughs> just tell her just don't go. Uh, that's funny. Sorry, I didn't see your, your comment there uh, right away, Striker, but that's funny. <laughs> Come back. You laugh delightedly. Okay. It has not yet occurred to you that, that what else the curse means, that you can never bathe or drink again. But who cares? You're a barbarian warrior. You seldom wash, and water is not your tipple of choice. For now, you set out across the lake to get your revenge. Turn to 73. Yeah, that could complicate things. I have to find somebody to lift the curse, I guess. Right? It isn't easy at first, this walking on water. In fact, it is like trying to cross a giant jelly. But soon you are stumbled, you are stumbling towards where Grinch and Grievous have moored the punt for the night. You made, they have made a small fire and are crouching beside it, roast, roasting an eel. Fun. You hear them cackling with vicious pleasure, like a pair of old blackbirds. Wish we could have hung around to see the look on that brute's face, says Grievous. Yeah, we fitted that barbarian up like a kipper, didn't we? Laughs Grinch. Or is it Grievous? You can never tell them apart. Won't matter much in a couple of minutes, though. Their own mothers won't be able to tell them apart. Bloom and neck, they cry as you race up the shore towards them. Then they waste no more time on words, preferring to draw the wickedly sharp daggers that are their weapon of choice. Ah, here it is. We gotta fight these guys. So Grinch and Grievous have the same stats. They've got combat four, body three. Grinch, Grievous. These guys had it coming, though. So they're a little stronger than the Satyr, but they're not going to be gaining power every round. You can't afford to flee since they have the map you need. This is a fight you must win. All right. So the, the thing that's kind of sad is there's uh, two of them. So I'm going to switch over to these, these red dice. And we'll use the black dice for, for us. Same odds. So let's see. They pull our they pull their weapons. But you're racing up to them. So I'm gonna say that you attack first. But the thing is, like, are you attacking each one of them? You can only do one attack per round. They gotta attack you twice. Let me just double check the rules here. Because I don't think you get two attacks. I think you just attack one and then they both attack you. So you have to kill them one at a time, essentially. No heroic brew. So a group of foes, all of them will get a chance to hit you every round. 
Regardless of how many opponents you are fighting, you yourself can only make one combat roll per round. This means that multiple opponents are very deadly. You must be careful. Now, as... <laughs> Shoot them, though. Um, let's see. We can use parrying. To parry, you need to roll one or two. See, it's it's hard to hit. Successful parry negates one blow struck against you in that round. Okay, so I guess that's what we would do. So if they if they hit us, we can try to parry. So we'll just keep that in mind. Okay. So first we're gonna attack. I guess it doesn't matter who we attack first because they both got the same stats. We'll attack Grinch. One. Okay. So he's down to two. Okay, so now we've got Grinch is going to attack us. Two. So that should be a hit. But, see, we're down to six. I forgot to notate that. So we're down to six. Um, let's try to parry. So one or two will block it. Five. Okay, we didn't block it. So we're down to five okay so now grievous is attacking line of sight yeah it doesn't really say um i guess we're just using a sword it's like you'd think that we could just use the bow at a distance five okay so he missed okay so now we're attacking grinch you know the old hero quest thing is you kill the uh Kill off uh, one monster so that there's uh, fewer guys attacking you. Six. Okay, we failed. Okay, so now they both get to attack us. So Grinch attacks. Four. Let's try to parry one or two. Ah, we get hit. It's four. Grievous attacks. Two. Let's try to parry one or two. Ah, we get hit. Come on, these guys can't kill us. All right. I don't think there's anything about the. Let me just uh, let me just double check because I would feel silly if we could somehow whip the bow out and start shooting them. It doesn't seem to matter what weapon you have. No, it doesn't seem to say anything different. But but no that. The part about um, getting the drop on them, I think, is well well put. I mean, the fact that you've got the bow, it's like, well, maybe your first attack was with the bow. That, that part makes sense, Striker. Good point. Okay, so Grinch is attacking. Three. Let's try to parry. One. Okay, we parried it. Yes. Okay, now uh, Grievous is attacking. Six. He missed. Okay, we're attacking Grinch. Three. He can't parry, so he's down to one. Okay, so Grinch is going to attack now. Two. Let's try to parry. Failed. So we lost. Down to two. Grievous. Five. He failed. Okay. So now we're attacking Grinch. One, he's dead. All right. <clears throat> and now, Grievous is the only one left, so he's going to attack us. Five, he failed. We're attacking him. Six, we failed. He's attacking us. Five, he failed. <laughs> We're attacking him. Three, he's down to two. Now he's going to attack us. Grievous attacks. Let's try to parry. Failed, so we're down to one. Uh-oh. All right, we're going to attack him. Four. He's down to one. Oh, man, one to one. How's that for some tension? Okay, so he's going to attack us. Three. Uh-oh. Let's try to parry. If we don't parry, this is it. One. We've parried. Yes. Okay. Now we're going to attack him. Six. Oh, we failed. 
Okay, now he's going to attack us. Two. Let's try to parry. Oh, no. We're dead. Shoot. It's a grievous killed us. Oh, man. Well, I mean, we could just pretend we didn't die and see what's next. But uh, we played for 45 minutes there. Let's check the chat. See how we're doing. Three, four, five. We got five of us. Yeah, nobody, nobody's left. Everybody's still here. Well, is there anything else anybody wants to see or talk about here today? There was one thing I could show off here to kind of end the stream. I mean, we did two two little adventures from this Tyrant's Tomb book, which uh, Dave Morris has on his blog for free. Actually, let me try to find it for you and send you the link here. Dave Morris fantasy blog. I always have to look it up because I forget. It's like called like Fabled Lands or something like that. Fantasy game book. Oh, Fabled Lands. Yep, there it is. So I'm just going to link it here. It's fabledlands.blogspot.com. So classic. Just going to share it there. Use your reroll. Oh, you want me to try one more time, Striker? Just go ahead and reroll it. Just see. Okay. Well, let's see if we uh, if we would have if we would have parried if we rerolled one more time. One or two. Nope. Two. <laughs> see, you never know, right? It's just the roll of the dice. Now I could have used my fancy die rolling cup to try to get it. Dice rolling tower. I mean, it's just a d6, right? These are just standard dice. But yeah, that's how it goes. But yeah, go to the Fabled Lands blog and you can download copies that he has distributed of his own books. So Fellowship of Four, The Screaming Spectre, sometimes mislabeled as The Screaming Skull, and Tyrant's Tomb. So the first one is Fellowship of Four. It's like the longest one, the most hero questy of the of the three. And then two is the Screaming Spectre. It's kind of like the wizard story. And then Tyrant's Tomb, what we were reading, is the barbarian one. I chose this just because I thought it'd be simpler, less to keep track of. Um, so, yeah. I mean, this was kind of fun. Maybe we should do this again next time. Maybe do a little read-along. Maybe do a little bit more prep so that everybody kind of knows what's going on, how we do it. But it was fun to do it and kind of learn, uh, you know, just how to do the combat and everything. You just need a pencil and paper and uh, D6, just a regular standard die. Okay, so here's something to show. Um, I, As you know, I like HeroQuest. Uh, I also like Battle Masters. And I actually printed up some custom cards here. So check these out. This, These are from uh, makeplayingcards.com. Not a plug. I pretty much just did, um, so if you can see here, this is, these are linen finish. See that? So these are a little nicer than the original cards. I mean, mine were really beat up uh, from the used set that I got. Because I never played Battle Masters back in the day, but that set was really beat up. So these are the ogre cards. So the ogre character has his move and attack. And I pretty much just scanned all my original cards and just redid them. So these are like a little bit darker. Then the original, of course, they were probably faded anyway. But I think they turned out really well. And these are uh, bridge size, if you're wondering. Bridge size cards, so they're nice and thin. And then these are the cards. And this, it's more of like a, a midnight blue. Theirs was like a brilliant blue, the originals. But again, you can see the linen finish, which makes them really nice to handle and easy to shuffle. And I, I used all the same cards that they had in the original. So in Battle Masters, you draw cards to know what uh, what units to put out. So you got the Chaos Army and the Imperial Army. And whatever's in the picture, that's what you get to move. 
So one person might be moving all their stuff and the other person is waiting for theirs to go. And once you get through the pile, you shuffle it and do, do it again. It's kind of fun. The, the, the problem with Battle Masters is it, it takes a little bit of setup time and you need like a lot of room. So you're either playing on the floor with your huge battle mat or just a really long table. One thing that we did when we played is we got one of these, um, they use them for photography. It, it's almost like a plastic hula hoop that has like cloth, like canvas cloth stretched over it. It's like green on one side and blue on the other for photography. And you can put that on a tabletop and it extends the table out. Because usually you put it on a table and maybe you put some leaves in the dining room table and it's long enough, but it's not wide enough. So with the uh, little uh, screen, stretchable screen, you've got enough room. As long as you don't lean on the table, because then you'd have some problems. But you've got room to put the battle mat out, which is like four and a half by four feet. And you've got all your unit trays and everything on it. So the one change that I made to this deck is that I edited some of the cards and I put uh, reinforcements. And I talked about this in the other stream about my idea of modding the game. So lots of people have come up with mods. Now, Battle Masters is a game. Excuse me. Um, Battle Masters is a game that I didn't play as a kid. So I had to just kind of learn it on the fly, learn how to play it. And it's pretty fun. It can take like an hour or two to play um, one army versus another. I, I prefer Hero Quest, but it's kind of a cool game. But the idea was, okay, I'll put reinforcements in, but how will I use these cards? So I thought, well, maybe instead of dealing these back into the deck, once they're used, they're just discarded completely. Because otherwise, you could just keep getting reinforcements and the game would never end. But I thought, okay, so if you if if uh, the ogre is still alive, you just ignore this. It's just an ogre card. But if he's dead, get the reinforcement. Instead of bringing the ogre back, though, you could choose to bring in like a new unit, like let's say some Fimmers. So I 3D printed some Fimmers, which I showed in the last stream. They're like these little green monster guys. And those guys could go on the tray that formerly the ogre had and go into battle. And then, I'm not sure what else I would give them, but uh, probably some Fimmers. And for the good guys, they could get some Dwarves or some Elves. And so I, in the last stream, I showed the uh, Warhammer Fantasy miniatures I got. I mean, I wasn't going to spend a fortune on those things. They were really hard to find. But once I used my uh, glue debonder, I was going to remove them from the bases. And, you know, they use the little slot of base thing where they have like a little, instead of this nice little base, they've got a little uh, tab that sticks out. And you can just put that right into the unit tray. So I haven't actually played a game with them yet that way, but I think it'd be a cool thing to do. Or maybe put a unit in the tower. So the idea would be you could rescue that unit and then use it. The problem is I don't have enough unit trays for the extras. So rather than deprive somebody on eBay of, you know, one of their unit trays, I probably just have one 3D printed. So I have a family member who has a 3D printer. I just got to get him to have the time to, to use it. So, yep, we're kind of wrapping up the stream here. But uh, yeah, if you, uh, you want to make your own Zargon dice, like I said at the beginning of the stream, it's really easy. Go to some place like Board Games Maker. You don't need vector-based images, just, um, you know, these uh, these HeroQuest uh, die faces, these images are out there. You just drag and drop the PNG or JPEG. I prefer PNG. Make it uh, larger, give it a nice border around the edge, uh, drag and drop it on there. And then the only thing is, these are going to be really expensive. These are going to be like $4.20 for six of them. I mean, that's per unit. Whereas, whereas if you get these from Spiel uh, Warren Saloon, these German dice, these are only $1.60 per die. And I think they look good enough. Or, you know, if you get these pink ones, 
you know, or whatever. I mean, the only point of having Zargon dice is just so, like, when you're rolling, you know, you could be rolling all these dice, and you're figuring out, like, okay, which ones are the heroes? Okay, well, these are, and then these are the monster ones, so you can keep them straight. Of course, what I've also done is notice how this dice box that I made out of just a wooden cigar box, painted it, varnished it with uh, shellac, and then... Uh, glued this felt in there you know you could just you've got one tray for the heroes one tray for zargon and so visually it's really easy to tell now you could use like a different colored felt for this if you wanted i constructed this box when i was playing over zoom so i just point my camera and it's like okay it was just easy to tell but i did another one earlier that i gave away as a gift where one side was uh green let's say green for the heroes and then black for Zargon. And I was just using, at that time, I was just using white dice for both sides. So, you know, you get your white dice, let's say. You can easily tell. These, of course, are the originals, so they're pretty beat up. But anyway, <clears throat> that's the stream. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here at HeroQuest Fans. Uh, I don't know if uh, I have to wait one week or two weeks for my, uh, almost said Space Quest. Um, Star Quest or Space Crusade. It's actually going to be Space Crusade because it's the UK version. It was called Star Quest in the Netherlands and Germany and places like that. That game is supposed to arrive uh, soon. I just don't know when, but hopefully in time for the next stream so that I'll, I'll have a new game to show off and talk about. Yeah, this, this, uh, this whole uh, Twitch stream thing gets expensive if you have to keep buying stuff to do show and tell, but I've got enough stuff that I really can just talk any old time. I mean, if we if we play this again next time, or if we go through one of these novels, that'll take some time, and I think it'll be enjoyable just to kind of see what's out there in the world of Hero Quest, because it's not just the board game, although that's what we all came for. So maybe in the future we will record a game and actually get to see it. Um, over the holidays, it just uh, one thing led to another as far as activities, and we didn't quite get that done. But maybe at a future time we will. There is a guy on YouTube. It's uh, always bored, never boring. B-O-A-R-D. He did uh, a bunch of stuff with uh, Space Crusade. And it looks like it's pretty easy. You could actually play Space Crusade against yourself, so to speak. And uh, that could be something. But mainly I'm going to want to do an unboxing, first of all. And then what comes after that, we'll just have to see. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Let's see if there's anybody else. Any other questions? Again, thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll be putting the stream onto YouTube shortly. Uh, lately, it's been taking a little bit longer to be uploaded. I don't know why. I guess I got to make sure that, you know, I didn't uh, play any copyrighted music or whatever. But uh, probably it'll show up within two to three hours. And then you can watch it there again from the beginning if you prefer. You can see if we uh, goofed up any of our roles doing the, uh, doing the game. But uh, everybody stay safe. Have a good night. And thanks. So that concludes the stream. Bye.